Might as well start off with welcome. Hello, welcome. We're doing uh, mapping today, or what happens when you try to map a nap uh, a nap ten stop on a map? Try to put it on a map and see what see what happens. Um, so we're going to start off. We're going to do an icebreaker. We're going to talk about the context, and I'm going to ask for your opinions and some some questions around that. I then want to talk about constraints, and in this one, I'm actually really interested in the local transport authorities and also the bus operators telling us the constraints that they have telling where a stop is. What equipment do you use? Are you using like surveying equipment or a handheld doodad? What kind of things are telling you where you are when you look at a stop and where you measure a stop? Um, we're then gonna have a look at some of the fields. We're gonna have a look at an example of where it's gone a bit wrong. Um, then we'll cover off the long term plans that we've got for NAPTAN and a little bit of feedback. So we've got a nice brisk two hours of fun. Um, just very quickly before we start and do the icebreaker, why are we spending time on maps? Spending time on maps because we'd like to build some decent business rules about them and then we can apply good business rules to the system. And I've just forgotten to do one thing. Just bear with me here two seconds. We want some nice consistent rules that we can apply to make sure that our data is of high quality. And that's one of the things that we've struggled with. We've looked through all of the rules that are currently there and they contradict each other and they don't quite make as much sense. And there's a lot of exceptions to them. So we want to find stuff that works. It doesn't have a ton of exceptions. Um, so this is kind of the exploratory session, and then we'll come back with something that's a little bit more. Here's some rules. What do you think of them uh, coming up? So starting off at the top, an icebreaker. Just for those who missed the very start, we're just doing a quick run through why we're mapping stops. We're wanting to build some business rules that make sense for mapping stops. So what we don't want is to say stops need to be so far from water and then Jared has to go and all the stops along Waterloo Bridge and all the stops along the embankment have to be marked as exceptions because they're too close to water and there's things like this. So we're just trying to find decent business rules um, and we want the business rules to be consistent and lead to good data quality for everybody. So the first thing that we're going to play is a little bit around context. And I'm just checking my time. I've got five minutes, so that's fab. I'll get you set up and then I'll run and then I'll be back. So what I'm trying to do is just have a look at a couple of examples. I'll walk you through them and then I would like to give you time to put some comments on them. So if you come and follow me over to the area called context, you'll see here on my screen, I've drawn up a funny little road intersection with a bus stop marked in the middle. Now, one of the things that our bus stops do or some of our systems can do is they can map, they can uh, lock to a road. So if this bus stop locks to the road called road, it is seen as if it's going in a northerly direction. If it locks to avenue, it could be going, its bearing could be west. And if it locks to street, its bearing will be south. And it will also fail some business rules when the, st the stop is named other than the street it is mapped to. So that cre that causes, that's one of the business rules that can fire. And it can also fail if one system, one part of the system thinks it's mapped to road when it's mapped to street and the bearing is for street and it says, no, 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 you're on road, your bearing is, a, is the wrong way around. So these, this is kind of describing that. And what I'd like you to do is have a think about what problems this causes you, if this does cause you any problems, if, if you're like, nah, this is completely fine, I never have any problems with this, let us know. We're just trying to figure out how much of a problem this one is. The next one down is where the mapped location is too far, too far from a road. So we've got a bus stop on a private road, like in a shopping centre, but the only road that the map knows about is the public road, and it says, your, your stop is too far from a road and I'm going to kick up a fuss because I don't think you could run a bus through there. Um, I want to understand again, if this is a problem, if this is something that you see, and if this is uh, a rule that we should apply or not apply. The next one, uh, I've tried to draw uh, Waterloo Bridge, but I, I got a bit um, 
weird. So I just drew embankment to Waterloo Road and a bridge through the middle over a river. And if the stops on the bridge, um, they're actually trigger an error where they're too close to water. So what I want to understand, is this something that happens for, for, for most people? Is this only happening for one or two people? Is this a rule that makes sense? Should we apply it? Is this a situation that actually happens? Um, and then the last one is around precision and accuracy. So you, we can end up with a three meter by three meter square with a bus stop in it. Should it be matched to the bus stop shelter, to the post, or to where the bus stops? Because when you get some of our um, accurate, some of our locations are mapped down to about a 10 centimeter square, which is very precise, but it's not actually accurate because it's mapped to the wrong part of that three meter by three meter spot. Or have I found a complication that doesn't actually matter? And then the very the other one around that is, do we want to provide, if I only provide the location in one format, um, either as an easting, northing or a latitude, longitude, does that cause anyone any actual issues or is it OK to only have them one way and you will work around and do them in the other format? So what I'd like to do is to give you a couple of minutes just to think about those different contexts and put any feedback you've got about those contexts. Are these real problems or are these just problems that I've found in the data and they don't matter in the real world? Will these things cause issues if we created a rule for them? And when it comes to precision and accuracy, where do you need to sit? But also, what part of a bus stop is the bus stop? Is it the pole? Is it the furniture? Is it where the bus stops? Because those two things can differ by a good couple of metres sometimes. So I'm just going to leave you for a couple of minutes um, while I run and get the bread that exploded out of my oven. And um, I will see you back here. I'm just going to put a timer on. OK, interesting one with that first one now with the road and street. I've just I use a, a package uh, for doing the routing and because the Ordnance Survey hasn't been in hasn't been imported for quite a number of years. I've, uh, they, they sent me a version of the OSM map, so the open street mapping. So I've loaded up that on, and the differences in where the roads are, where the road centre line is, and where the effect on the stop, whether which side of the, which road it's serving, is noticeable because previously everything was up and running, no problem. Change of a mapping, and uh, I've got a lot more work suddenly than I expected. So I, I would be interested is when anybody's doing some analysis and checking or quoting figures or reporting back on standards of NAPTAN, what mapping level layer they're using and whether that's an agreed accepted layer or not. That's a really good comment, Ian. And in fact, that I've got an entire section called when it goes wrong, that I'm going to talk through some of that. So I'd be really, really interested in your comments there. Uh, Gerard, you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, it's just a really, um, I can't, I'm on a mobile at the moment, so I can't actually access more. So I'll be another one who's um, just sort of commenting as and when we, we go through the various posts. Brilliant. Thank you so much for letting me know. Really appreciate that. I did, I did wonder at your, at your office being outside when I saw you, uh, when you did your intro. So with this first instance, stop named other than the street that it's mapped to and bearing does not match street that it's mapped to. Um, I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Map base important here, difference between OS, which is Ordnance Survey, OSM, which is Open Street Map here. I don't know what here is. Could somebody, uh, could somebody explain or help me understand what here is, is it, or is it just another map? That that was me, Dr. J, causing trouble again. Yeah, here is a mapping provider. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I think they used to um, be Nokia, didn't they? Or part of them, but anyway. Or, or was that Tom Tom? Tom Tom were part of Nokia. Uh, uh, Gerard. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry to jump in. So sorry to jump in so early on it um i think there's sort of there's a particular issue in terms of um the sort of structure of work 
in so, when it comes to coordinates because although I'm responsible for putting the Greater London data into NAPTAM, it's not me who's actually measuring the <laughs> coordinates. So I'm relying I'm relying on other sort of colleagues within TFL to actually determine correct coordinates, but I'm not doing the surveying myself. So there's a bit of a sort of structural issue that I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know whether this is like this for other sort of uh, other organisations or colleagues, but I'm, I'm not the person, I'm not the same person doing the sort of coordinate measurements. So I'm a little bit unclear in, in TFL circles how that happens and what they're actually using. And that, that does potentially cause an inconsistency issue as well. It's not quite the same point there, but it's probably structures probably worth bearing in mind certainly in my organization i think that's a really good point and i'm going to put it under the constraints part because that's one of the pieces that we're going to come to next um and that's a really good point for us to understand let me just come back to here <clears throat> waiting for my computer to catch up with me. Um, bearing, uh, bearing of the road immediately by stop may be quite different to the general direction of either bus or road around the stop. I think that, so if the stop's on a bend and uh, it does it as north, but in fact it bends off to the west, um, then the bearing should be west rather than north because that's the way that the bus is going to go. Is that what somebody's saying there? Have I understood, have I kind of mapped that out correctly with hand waving? Um, bearing may be slightly wrong. Is the avenue westbound or northwestbound? Uh, depends on the accuracy or projection used of the underlying road location to define what is the closest road. <laughs> Nicholas, did you have a, a a comment there? So, oh, sorry, I had my my uh, microphone on. I was coughing. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was thinking I I was thinking I'd said something. Um, oh, and you were no, trying no. to interrupt me. Um, I apologize. Uh, I'll, I'll, turn, I'll, I'll I'll yeah, I'll turn the uh, the microphone off. <laughs> no worries. Uh, causes problems with electronic bus registrations. Stopped or automatically picked up along the perceived route, but a stop may not actually be on that particular route. Ah, so does this mean that the that the bus is going along the road and it thinks that it would it would pick up that stop, but it doesn't it's the bus doesn't actually stop at that stop. So this is kind of one of those ones of um where there's three or four stops in a row but the bus stops in the middle. Is that the sort of thing we're talking about? Gerard, I was about to give a TFL example living in London. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, great minds think alike. Uh, I mean, I think it, this wasn't my post, but I think there's a, there's a couple of uh, distinct issues here. See, as you say, you've got, you've got a sort of a collection of bus stops at, say, Waterloo Station that are sort of close to each other, where routes are separated out generally by direction. So you, your buses to Brixton would be grouped in one place and your Elephant and Castles would be another one. Um, but you've also got a concept of limited stop routes, so a bus will go along a road, but it wouldn't actually serve all stops. But there's also, and I've never really understood how this works in terms of open data, but and I, I think, think colleagues who are involved with timetables will do this as well. There's also a process called georeferencing um, because buses won't necessarily always follow the most logical route between stops in some cases or the most direct route. So what we would do would be we would have a, we'd have a base mapping system and we'd actually clip the clip the bus through to the correct correct roads and that means it should actually get a, a, a sensible and accurate depiction of, of the actual bus route not not just a load of straight lines um if i just sneak in something else so i'm not dominating this um i've seen open street map mentioned as on a post as well um just sort of it's almost a question as well as a comment I'm not clear how um, bus stop information actually even reaches OpenStreetMap. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of OpenStreetMap, but I've never got a decisive sense of how how stops actually reach it. Is it, is it just someone doing a bulk up open that time or are people sort of doing them in the piecemeal fashion in their own area? I've never really understood it, but I'll, I'll stop sort of uh, I'll stop talking. But it's just a couple of observations. Um, thanks, Gerard. And in fact, OpenStreetMap is one of the things that we'll talk about when we get to when when does it go wrong. Um, and 
uh, I hopefully somebody will be able to explain it. I think I can trace it from the data points that they're using, but we'll, we can figure them out. Di, you've got a comment. Yeah, that, that comment you were asking about was mine. Um, it's if, if the bus service goes, in your example there, goes a long road and straight across the crossroads, but the actual bus stop is on street or even on avenue, but it's picking that up um, automatically because it's so close mm. to the road, and yet it cannot possibly serve that stop because the actual stop is on a different street altogether. That's OK, you... so. So so if it if the stop is on street and the bus is going up road, some of the electronic systems will say, oh, we can use this bus stop that's yes. on street. And you're like, there's no way you could use that bus stop. You're exactly. you're going somewhere else completely. Yes. Got it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Nicholas. Hi, um, just referring to that comment uh, uh, question in relation to open street map, um, I can answer that and that is a simple case of it's added manually. Um, a map, an omni, a, a, a map editor, in inverted commas I suppose, uh, would physically add the stop in and things like the ATCO code, the stop name, etc. are fields that have to be populated populated by a user so uh, it, it for there's there's cases where uh, where i've seen um sometimes i make edits in order to assist uh our data coordinators with app, things like access roads and that and i have seen cases where a bus stop is marked Sometimes it'll have the stop name in, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it'll have an ATCO code, sometimes it won't. It's just down to what information has been put in by a particular editor by that, at that particular time. Cool, thank you, Nicholas. That's a okay. really, really good piece of information for us. Uh, Peter. Well, and Nick, Nicholas is the right, right. You're right about the, 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 the individual editors. But just another aspect of it um, there was quite a few years ago discussion um, in which uh, quite controversial with OpenStreetMap, they uh, did import in some areas ATCO uh, data as a almost as a data source because of the richness of uh, this information of suburbs and, uh, and naming. Um, so some of the information that's in there is actually from automatic or, or from um, uh, data downloads from NAPTAN at the time. And it was organized through OpenStreetMap on an area by area basis. And the editors in the area had to to vote and agree uh, that they would um, accept uh, this uh, assistance uh, that was that was given. Um, so it, it was something that the OpenStreetMap community um, debated and did some time ago. And it does mean that quite a lot of the NAPTAN data um, in, that is in OpenStreetMap, in particularly in some areas, might be quite out of date. Um, but on the other hand, it is being updated by and curated by all the volunteers who go into the mapping system and, and put it right and augment it. Great. Thank you, Peter. That's that's again also really, really useful. I've noted that down. Um, getting back to this particular problem, um, one causes particular problem with roads which have one name but have a terrace row name. Um, it will flag up as being a problem when it isn't. So does this mean it's like uh, um, Slater Road, Slater Terrace? Is that is that the one that we're talking about? I'm just trying to understand and pick this one a little bit. I'm not quite yeah, sure what the difference. That's, yeah, that's me. Oh. Dr. Jason. Sorry, Alex. Um, yeah, like a really long, long road. But the the they'll be like, you know, we, we, we've got one. It's like Commercial Street, but there's no actual houses on Commercial Street. They're Milton Terrace on the one side. Then they go on to Nelson Terrace. And so when you plot it, what is the road name? If you call yes. it Commercial Street, that, that runs for like five miles. So... But very often the the terraces are not necessarily in some of uh, they seem to be missing from databases if you try to play like google maps you drop a, a, a pin there it'll only come up with like commercial street or whatever it won't bring the terrace names up so it'll flag up as an error i think 
uh, there might I might have some of that in the problem in the uh, when I talk about when it goes wrong. But if it's not pointed, if it's not obvious there, let's bring that one across. And then I like your other one. Can be a problem when the road name has a dubious spelling. I like the way you use the word dubious when it comes to Welsh names. Um, <laughs> when it has a hyphen or characters such as a coik and o with a hat in the road names, which is particularly common with Welsh road names. So you're running into the problem of the rules are triggering even when they're when they're right because of the hyphens and the yeah. and the little hats on top of um I've vowels got, and things like I've that. Got two, I've got two hawthorns. One one's hawthorn with an E and one's hawthorn without an E. And depending on which one you put it in, it'll tell you if it's wrong. Oh wow. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so these rules where it's trying to match is sometimes not making the the right sense. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, the street name should identify which road the stop is on. The direction may fail if it's not set correctly. Yes. Um, yes, definitely have issues with stop near different roads. Seems to be the mapping software as they make them thinner, so harder to define. Suggest allow a drop down to request which road applies. I actually have an idea on that and it'd be good just to test that out. Direction is when the bus is correctly stopped at the stop, not where it will be going. Ah, so it's so the bearing is not where the bus is going to go next, it's where it's facing when it's stopped. That's really, really good. And I'm just going to just put a little quick note in there. Bearing Nicholas. Just um Picking up on that, and it's just actually prompted me. Uh, I don't know if this is the case in other regions, um, and this, but in in the southwest region, uh, with with Andy Hole's data and uh, and that, um, if a stop is at a bus station, then there generally isn't a bearing. Okay, that's a really good. So I'll just put a note, note, stop at a bus station, bus station, might not have a bearing. That is really good to know because that is one of those little triumvirates of data. Um, so let's go across onto this private estate bit. So it's trying to talk about where there's um, it could be a new a new road. It might be on private land in terms of it's within a shopping centre or it's within an industrial light industrial estate or something like that. Um, depends. In theory, every road should be mapped. Important for school stops, so it could be a lot of stops with this problem. Is a problem for private roads and for new estates. New roads and private roads should be a mapping system. So always be a case that some maps are more up to date than others. In OpenStreetMap may be able to circumnavigate by changing the status of the road or user could add the road in them themselves. Need a backup plan in case we are unable to see stop accuracy on the map, i.e. email warning. New development, revised roads, layouts, hospitals, supermarkets, school grounds. The problem comes with the field name for road name. Usually we just use grounds or unnamed. Good warning though. Okay, so that's good to know. Is there any other things that we haven't thought about when we're thinking about it's on private land and it's a long way from a public road? Before I move on. Um, the next one down, we have a rule where we buffer a road link by 50 metres to cover this in checking data. So this means as long as it's within 50 metres of a road, it doesn't trigger this, it's too close to water. Is that what, is that what we're saying here? I'm just double checking it. Yes, myself. So it's more when we, we, from a commercial perspective, when we do checks on bus stops uh, for routing purposes, uh, we take the centre line of a road, um, and if we see it's within 50 metres of a centre link, uh, then we allow it, basically. Yeah. Right. Because not on the creation side, it's more downstream. That makes sense. It's it's trying to figure out what we can do to make putting data into NAP10 better and easier so that we end up with the right data and kind of flagging up 
the right problems and not the wrong problems. Yeah, um, that, ooh, on, on that one, but I guess 50 meters, some people have said that's way too much because 50 meters, if you're near a coast road, it could be yeah, 50 meters out of sea is quite a long way, but that's just kind of yeah. what it's a happy yeah. medium. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally appreciate it. Many of our stops are for ferries which need to be close to water. Totally agree. Um, uh, most of the ferry stops end up having to be uh, said that they're, that they're too close. Right, let's move down to precise and accurate. Let me just make that one purple so that I know that it's my it's my one for the area. So all coordinates are calculable from one system to, from one to another. System should store only one, but could export all formats. But that's fine. It's which one, and also the precision, because one of the things that we've found is um, on the current system, the easting northings gives. I think it's a three meters by three meters square, but for some reason the um, latitude and longitude has been provided down to almost a 10 centimeter precision. Dan, I know you've probably got words to say on this, um, but this is yeah. kind of one of the things that we're trying to fix with new NAPTAN of just going, we're not going to try to calculate anything until we know exactly what, what we need to do. I'll say very quickly, so easting northing would be one metre or ten metres. There's not a three metre option there. So it'll be one <laughs> metre or ten metres based on that. Oh, that's me not being able to read um, the size of something. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. So that should be one metre by one metre, not three metres by three metres. Um, close to where the bus interacts with the roadway footway. Precise but not accurate depends on where the stop is. Could mean it's in it's next to the wrong road. So if if it swings on on sides, I have two stops where the pole is on the roadside, but the actual shelter is around the corner. Provision of both the latitude and longitude and grid could lead to inconsistencies. Would prefer one or the other. I prefer grid. Location only provided in one format. Ah. The stop location should be where the door of the bus should be when correctly stopped at the stop. Needs to be where the bus door is going to be accurate to the shelter is OK, but causes a problem with AVL as sometimes the system will record a bus departing a stop early, but in fact it is only five metres further along. Um, mapping may be incorrect, particularly if badly drawn an open street map slightly out. Mapping matches a satellite layer, but not others or may be out of date. Um, is there any other thoughts on these couple of points before we move along? I've also been asked to move stop slightly. Uh, I'll go to this one. We use OSM <laughs> open. Sorry, I'll let you type while I do this one. Okay. We use open street mapping and update on a weekly basis. We used to have ordinance survey mapping, but it got massively expensive. And I've been asked to move stop slightly as stagecoach ticket machines are not picking up locations. I'll 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 I'll, I'll look away for a moment. Um, Nicholas. Another another prompt for that I've just had. Um, I would I would agree with the case of using a flag or, where, or the front of a stop because we actually have bus stops where there is uh, a pair of shelters to serve the stop, um, particularly a, a busy stop. So it might be a double length stop, uh, which has two shelters, but one post with one flag on it. And we've also got cases where stops are on a corner and one shelter is effectively serving two separate stops. That that makes a ton of sense, and I can totally understand that. So I've just made a little note here. So it should be the flag or front of bus where the door will be is the location. Um, just wanted to check with the people, and I'm I'm sure hopefully somebody is on here from a bus company. If that is if that is the way that we define location, is that going to cause is that the sensible way for ticketing machines and things like that to know where they are? Uh, hi, hi, Dr. J. It's, it's Nicholas again. Um, 
we have a setup. We use the ticket to system, and we have a setup where we can have an envelope uh, around a bus stop, which basically means that as long as the bus is within that envelope, which is usually a bit about 25 meters, it can be shrunk, it can be enlarged, um, but it will say that the bus is on time late early when it leaves that envelope. So if if the bus stop is if, is a couple of meters out compared to where it should be, in our case, it wouldn't matter because the envelope would be large enough to encompass it still wherever. That sounds really good, Nicholas, and, and hopefully we can, that's something that we can show to everybody and start to build up, hey, here's a really good way of solving the the buses early or the buses late because the bus is a metre away from the stop, from where the, the door should be. Um, so is there any, before I, just before I move on, is there anything else that we need to cover on context? I'm just double checking. I think I've covered everything. The next thing I wanted to quickly cover is constraints and just get an understanding of what constraints that we're operating under. So essentially, we've got the one from Gerard where NAPTAN person doesn't do the coordinate measurement. So you're effectively just putting in the data. You're not the one doing the measuring. Um, one of the things that I wanted to understand from people who might be measuring or have people measuring, how do you measure? Is it done with a phone? Is it done with a GPS device? Is it done with um, theodolites? I believe that they're called the the things on the with the which 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 you look through like telescopes. Um, how are you measuring where the stop is, um, and what level of accuracy do you think you can get down to? And what are the other things that I'm not even thinking about that are going to cause problems when you're trying to map a stop? So I'd like to give you about. Uh, three minutes to think of anything there. I'm just going to start the timer now. Let me go up through this and uh, through this context, and then we'll run down and we'll run a little quick polling exercise. So talking about constraints. Um, so we've got the one from Jared. Nap ten person doesn't do coordinate measurements. Not finding out when the local highways team moves move the bus stop sometimes to a completely different junction. A mixture of Google operator detail and information given by colleagues. Did some survey work of the past, but inexpensive project. We have been working with travel line coordinators to improve accuracy by sending colleagues to individual stops and gain coordinates by standing next to the bus stop flag and recording it. Now, the person who wrote this, can you tell me what tool, what physical doodad they were using to get those coordinates? Were they using a GPS recorder or a, a phone or something else? Hi, that, that was that was uh, that was me, Nicholas. Um, I, I believe it's actually been done using the humble uh, mobile phone. Um, I, I I don't know the exact ins ins and outs of it, uh, but what I might be able to do is is get uh, one of my colleagues to. To send you some more information on that if, if necessary um but i do know it's it's having a colleague stood with a phone in his hand <laughs> recording it whilst whilst he's sat <laughs> there because part of the reason why we've been doing this is also um we're rolling out tap on tap off um and in order to make sure that customers are, are charged the correct fare we're we're getting the accuracy confirmed uh, the location accuracy confirmed so that the and again it comes back to these envelopes and that um so that a machine doesn't inadvertently trip over into an adjacent fair stage just by its location and overcharge a customer so that's part of the reason why we're doing that thanks Th thanks for that and that would be good to know because um it, it, knowing what's measured it can also give a sense of the accuracy of that measurement. Yeah, um, sure. the, the only tool we use is Grid Reference Finder on the web overlaid on Google Maps. Somewhat crude as a measuring tool, but back to the reality of accurate geographically or accurate visually, it's so annoying to see the blue bus stop symbol in Google not quite on the stop in the satellite view, even though you know it's accurate in Ordnance Survey. 
I think we're going to get to that when we get to when it goes wrong. Uh, what three we, we are using what three words more and more, but that's only accurate if the person with the phone is at the correct lay by and what three words is a three meter box. It is not linear. Uh, when you say Dan, it's not linear. Does that mean that it's it's always a three meter box, even though it moves or you can't tell where it is because it's linear? Uh, that, that she wasn't me. Uh, oh. I wrote that comment. But, no. uh, Tim, was it was it you that wrote that comment? Yes, yes, yeah. They they the, the way that they flatten um, the the world to do their grid means that um, it's not always three meter by three meter. It's an approximation. Ah. Mm -hmm. So this is the one where a three meter by three meter up in the highlands will be bigger than a three meter by three meter down in the south of England. Yes, that's right. It, it's Even not, if it's just a little. It's not yeah. so bad the effects in the UK because it's a three meter across the whole world. It's really bad, especially towards the poles and the equator and things like that due to the spherical nature of the world. And a three yeah. meter by three meter is designed to be on a square surface, basically. And totally got totally got an understanding of the problem, even if my maths is probably not up to it. Um, we also use a combination of mapping and satellite and Google Street View. One of my local authorities had an external company audit their stops and the accuracy was no good because it was raining and they stayed. <laughs> and they stayed in their van. <laughs> Sorry. OK, um, <laughs> that's an interesting comment. Thank you very much for that one. Um, that is a, 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 a problem that we would face with sampling. A coordinate is a fixed point, so if a location is chosen using hardware, it will be consistent. If choosing by an underlying map, this can cause inaccuracies based on the correct positioning of roads and features on the map. The user won't know as they think it is right. So this is when you're using a map and going it's on the corner of the street in this street so you put the pin there but that can be different to where the actual location is because the map can move a couple of meters and this leads to all the problems that we're going to cover in when it seems to go wrong um, is there anything else that i haven't covered in complications or constraints i didn't think they didn't get out the van was going to be one of them but that's made my day. Um, so very, very quickly, I just wanted, and I know all the people who came to the previous one, um, could you just give me, uh, and this will be a two minute one, again, we've got ACTO code, NAPTEN code and comment name. We're on the next, we're on number four now on fields. Um, when we come down, you'll see crossing indicator. Um, and then I've got grid type. East, east, north for eastings and northings, lat long for latitude and longitude and bearing. Um, if you could just take a minute and put comments besides and focus a bit more down on the ones about the mapping parts. Um, let me know which ones are the ones that you're most interested in and whether or not you use these and what they're used for. Um, the, the other one that I'm really interested in is indicator. Um, so if you could just kind of tell me a little bit more about how you use indicator and then grid type, easting, northings, latitude, longitude and bearing. Just let me know how you use those and what you think they should be. So I'm, I'm going to give us a couple of minutes for that. Just to let you all get through and do and, and do that. OK, so I'm going to um, start reading through these. Uh, let me just run up to the top. Fantastic. Oh, I forgot to do the vote. Okay, I'll run back and do the voting in a second. So, indicator. Stands are marked A, B, etc. The letter is marked on the bus stop flag for passengers to be able to confirm they are on the correct side of the road. <clears throat> Used indicator to define on timetables, especially opposite side of the road. Stops marked with additional references such as A, B, etc., or stand numbers and bus stations. Other uses are too numerous and not specific. By near, adjacent, etc., all mean different things to different people. Stop or bearing. This is 
Omni Man. Oh, that moves down there. So that moved. Um, yeah, one of the things that came up from the last one on names, which is why I just wanted to ask about Indicator, is um, Indicator has some 14,000 um, different values within Naptan. So it's not possible currently to do anything smart and programmatic with it. And that was part of just kind of prompting what people are using it for. Uh, grid type can be <coughs> can be useful to show the difference between Irish and Great British stops. One quick question for you, for, for the person saying that. Um, Northern Ireland isn't currently a Naptan, so there, are, there could not be any Irish stops within our data. All references should be in UK OS or UK grid types. Is there any reason for this? And Tim, you'll probably tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, they might not be in NAPTAN database that the Department of Transport holds, but they do use NAPTAN as their um, stop referencing standard. Um, right. As does the Republic of Ireland, interestingly. Ah, good to know. So, so our standard is used by the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. So, um, and Ireland and Northern Ireland use the same standard, but it's not the one held by us. Well, yeah, but it, part, some of the reason it's not held by you is the the FT database at the moment. Um, being Naptan 2.1, it doesn't support it. You need to move to, I forget whether it's 2.4 or 2.5 to support um, that and the Isle of Man. Uh, yes, yes. And that's something that I'm going to come and talk to you about um, how we do this. But um, that's for you and me to have a phone call on. Northern Ireland and Ireland both use the same DIVA system as we do. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, this was that lovely screenshot, which is stop or bearing. This is OmniMap Omnibus systems telling us how it works. Um, we, Eastings and Northings, we use this as our single source of truth and convert to latitude, longitude and the back end. Is that because Easting Northings are more accurate or you just like them better or they're easier to use? Just wanted that's to it. understand your feelings. But it's just, that's just us. So yeah, we just, uh... When showing on a map, we just need to be consistent. So we just use the Easting Northing and then just show it the lat long that way. We could have done it the other way around and just done the lat long and then converted to Easting Northing when we needed to. But having two different ones can be a bit confusing sometimes. So we decided to use Easting Northings. No real reason for it. That's great to know. Um, somebody uses this, somebody's, somebody does use. Uh, we can export both coordinate types as one is calculable from the other. All geospatial database systems should understand this. So if we provided one, they can always calculate the other. Do not use, although it is automatically populated when a pin is dropped on a map used in my software. We import both, but it is important they are consistent. Otherwise, we don't know which one is correct. That's something that um, I actually am thinking of asking somebody to go and check because I know that we've been doing some calculations and I want to make sure that we've not got any um, anyone providing two two references which aren't to the right aren't to the same spot. Um, for bearing, this is the direction a bus would be facing when stopped at the stop. Critical to identify when a bus is arriving at a stop, especially when stops are present on both sides of a road. This one really bothers me. North is not the same as northbound. A road with a bend in it might mean the bus uh, when stopped is heading south, but the service is heading north. Going up a valley, people would say northbound regardless of which way the bus was facing. Oh, thank you for expanding on that, whoever did that for me. Um, that makes sense. When we use bearing, is bearing something that's generally used by our passengers or is bearing something that's used by the systems to determine that the bus is the right bus? And maybe that's a larger question that, that we could sit down and consider. So. Um, for, for us, um, we'd consider bearing the kind of direction of a bus at the time. It wouldn't be affect whether it's. Um, So 
so so so justin in your technology the bearing is the way the bus is facing at the time that it's stopped yeah so so we use that for within our system to kind of detect whether it's at a bus stop or it's heading in the right direction for that bus stop not doesn't necessarily affect whether it's whether that bus is a northbound service or not yeah yeah um i i get that i'm going to do a quick comparison to the tubes of no matter um because some of them like the Bakerloo line have bends in them, but you always refer to them as whether they're running north or south, um, northbound or southbound, because you need to know which which platform to catch. It's kind of like that, but your ticketing system is doing the kind of the same thing of going, it doesn't matter if it's northbound and I'm currently facing west, facing west is the right thing because that means that I'm at the bus stop. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I'm sorry. I just needed to repeat it again to make sure. Um, bearing can I, would sorry, Dr. J, can I just pick up on that one? Because that was, that was yeah, my sure. comment. When, when we plot it, we plot we plot it as the schema. So so whichever way the bus is actually stopped, uh, we would plot it. You know, if if the bus is facing south, it would face it would be facing south. And on a map, somebody would maybe see the arrows, so they would know. But if you just looked at a timetable, and you had you know 20 stops, it would say I don't know the red lion northbound. Um, the playground northbound so then you can have an odd stop which is going to say um you know uh the rose and crown southbound and then the rest of them say, so from a public transport user's point of view without a map that looks odd because the bus in their head is going northbound yes at that point the bus has suddenly turned south on a bend in the road and i think it's that when the date this back to this thing when the data is absolutely 100 percent accurate but when data then transfers to information when the public see it, that just looks odd. So that's so, an example where I try I would try to get that no, that southbound out to that and replace it with something else adjacent to outside, just so that it, in a list stops, it didn't look all odd. Does that I clear that up, you? I totally get that, and I think this is the difference between bearing and indicator. Of indicator is what the public needs to see to know where the bus stop is, and bearing is what a system needs to see exactly, to know yes. where the bus stop is. Yeah, and definitely. it's separating those two out, and definitely. also separating out how they're used in our minds a little bit more, so that yeah. we can be a little bit clearer on it. That's but that's really great. Thanks, Alex. Um, before we move on to when it seems to go wrong, I'm going to jump us back to something and I'm just going to set up a very quick voting section. So I'm just going to ask the question, is USRN, would USRN be useful? Actually, I'll change the question. If I can manage to do this. Would USRN be useful? So there are four options. Yes, no, no idea. And what is USRN? So I'm going to set up a quick voting session and I'd like you to vote. You're all going to get just one vote. Um, and I'd like you to vote on whether it's yes, no, no idea or what is USRN? Just take a second and just give me your gut feel right now. I know this is just a quick straw poll. It's going to give us an idea as to whether we chase something down, whether we're chasing, we're a terrier chasing a rabbit down a rabbit hole, or whether we have just decided to go run off in the long grass for no, for no useful reason. So let's have a look. We've got a couple of people who've already voted. I'll just give it a minute and get some of these through. And when we're finished voting, I will get any comments that we've got about USRNs. So got a few more people just to finish up. Uh, if you don't know what a USRN is, please indicate what is a USRN because it's just letting me know where we're sitting with this. Okay, so we've got more people who've voted than haven't voted. So I'm now going to end the voting and see where we ended up. So we had six people asking, what is a USRN? Two people voted yes, and one person voted no, and one person voted on, on the question. Um, 
So, when we talked to the people at Street Manager, they introduced us to the idea of a unique street reference number. And this is something that exists in their system to allow people who are doing digging up street things to know exactly which street that they're on and where that street is. So one of the things that we are starting to just kind of pull, pull on a little thread of is, is there a way to link that unique street reference number? Is that something that we can use for some of this um, making stuff a little bit clearer? especially when you've got roads that are all a bit different. And one of the th useful things of a unique street reference number is it breaks long roads into sections um, of shorter bits. I don't remember how big the shorter bits are, but it breaks long roads into shorter bits. So it allows us to say, well, on this long road, this bus stop is in this particular part. Now, this obviously wouldn't be anything we would show to the public, but it would allow us to indicate a little bit clear, clearer on mapping. One of the useful situations might be is when you've got crossroads or like our first example with Road Street and Avenue, it would allow you to indicate which of those the bus stop is actually located on. Dan, your thoughts would be really useful. So yeah, US on is 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 great. Um, it's not as free. It's open data, so it doesn't cost any money. Anyone can have access to it as a free shapefile. Uh, I unfortunately clicked a, the question as opposed to an answer. So my answer would have been yes. Uh, I got a bit confused there. Uh, the issue with USRN <laughs> though is it's not very small. Uh, so it can be whilst it is one road, a road could be quite some distance. So that could reference um, 400 meters of a road, 300 meters of road, or something like that. So it wouldn't be good for the accurate positioning of the of the stop or anything like that, but it'd be a really useful linked identifier where you can link mm -hmm. that data to other other data sets or the more detailed uh or the more detailed ordnance survey data or something like that. But it is an open data set and it is it is quite a good thing as, as an extra field to have. And also you can then link it into UPRN potentially, which is a unique property reference number, which again is another uh, open data set. So you could say actually it's outside this UPRN reference or something like that. But anyway, that's probably getting a bit too a bit far too far down the rabbit hole. Uh, uh, just chasing the rabbit for two seconds, the UPRN, that's more accurate, that is more accurate than a unique street reference number. So it would tell you outside which house or which property the bus stop is on yeah, this exactly, unique exactly street. Exactly, exactly that. So a unique yeah. property reference gives every property in the country a unique reference number, whilst a unique street reference number is a collection of uh, junction to junction. So if you think of a road, it's split into links, and the link is between two junctions. It's a collection of them that make up a, a street or a road. But yeah, everywhere a USRN is consistent across the whole network, and there's a free open data set you can download. But it's a bit, it's been, it's uh, got more straight lines in it. It's a bit more of a simplified network than you can see on OSM or anything like that. Great. That's 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 really useful. Um, that's one of the things that we've been just thinking about and it will come up when we talk when we talk in the strategy um does anyone else have any thoughts around unique street reference numbers is this the first time for a lot of people i know this is the first time we've heard of them so i just kind of wanted to kind of drop it out there as a as a little teaser and see and see how people were thinking about it um, um dr jay just quick question sorry what what constitutes a street what, what would be the longest distance for a street um, I don't know. I'm going to have to go and find out from the from the people who do this thing. They showed me it based in Westminster, around Westminster Abbey, which has a whole pile of streets crisscrossing each other, and they showed us how it could be, how they use it there. So I need to go and do some research, and this was more, should I go do this research, or is mm -hmm. this a, a red herring that somebody is, is, is waving in my face? Tim. <clears throat> I was just thinking from a rural point of view, what, uh, how it would differ from, uh, especially London. Uh, how yeah, would... yeah. I need to go. I need to go and do some thinking about it. But what I'll do is I'll bring it back when we next, when we come back to do mapping number two. Um, I will bring back some stuff on USRN. How's that? Yeah, they're they're but... pretty much the same length as. Um, a um, ordnance survey road link in master map or something like that um because um 
they do go from junction to junction. So if you've got lots of side roads and um, turnings and things, it can be very short. But in theory, it could be a few kilometres long, I guess. Um, because farm so... tracks and things like that get included um, and, and cause a break. Um, it's, not, so, it's not that quite detailed, Tim. So it's not, it's not, an, uh, it's not an OSGB link, which is between two. It's a collection of them that makes up the street. So it's not the yeah. link itself. It's like it could be 10 different of them links tied together. Um, Dan, what I might do is work with you and the Street Mapper team who have asked us to look at how we do some uh, inter interoperability between our datas, just to kind of have a think and we can bring something back maybe um, to the next public, uh, to the next time we do mapping and kind of talk about what this might be and see if people think this is the right place to go or might, it might not even be a place where people have appetite to go because it's got too many bad things on it. Yeah, sure. And that sounds great. Di? Just thinking that whilst this all sounds wonderful, if this can't be incorporated into my existing software, then I'm literally still going to be using more than one uh, source in order to plot my bus stops. I'm not wanting to make your life harder. I want to make your life easier and far, far nicer and not have you doing tons of admin. So we're not going to go and change anything until we know exactly what impact it's going to have on it, on everyone. And we've got a plan for managing that impact. OK, thanks. OK, so I'm not about to say you've suddenly got to use this. Simon. Hello. Um, just about the USRNs. I think um, not all streets are represented by USRNs, so they issued by GeoPlace um, and the local authorities apply them to roads that they normally adopt, so not all roads are covered. And then um, geographically, the USRNs aren't necessarily topographically correct, so they don't necessarily always follow the road links. Um, so again, there's some shortcomings, but um, yeah, just a couple of observations there. That's that's really good to know. So thank you for that. Um, and like I said, I, I this was more a teaser of going, should I go chase this down? It sounds like this is interesting enough just to kind of unpick enough to come back with this is what it's all about and here's some of the constraints and get people's mm. thoughts from there. I guess you also need to go back to the um, level of accuracy you want in terms of that you know, one metre, three metre, five metre, because those streets yeah. are quite different to perhaps what people may want. Absolutely. And which bit of a street are we talking about? Are we measuring yep. the centre line? Are we measuring the mm -hmm. curbs? Um, yep. If there's which no the curb road? and it just, which, yeah, yep. all of those fun things. So let's crack on with when it all seems to go a bit wrong. Now, my apologies to G Gerard. Um, I've chosen something simply because I've chosen a stop simply because it's outside one of our team's houses. Um, so you now know where one of our teams, our team lives, and we've chosen this simply because um, he, they live on a new building, uh, a new build area, which has been around for a couple of years, and it's kind of looking at some of the mapping problems and trying to understand it. So we've got a stop here called Salter Close. Um, it's on Cane Hill Drive near Salter Close, which is a, a, side, a, a dead end side road. Um, when I go onto Ordnance Survey, I tried to use Eastings Northings to find something. Never used Eastings Northings or anything to find something not beyond a postcode before. So I might actually need some some help on the future of how to do this. But this was Ordnance Survey, and this was also Ordnance Survey when I did some Googling to try to find it. That's just more giving you a sense of where we are. Here is the fun. Google Maps has the two bus stops mapped to the same side of the street and in slightly the wrong place. Apple Maps, when I show transport, has the bus stops, one of the bus stops in completely the wrong place because it's in the middle of Salt or Close, which the bus doesn't go down because it stays on Cane Hill Drive. Um, when I go to City City Mapper or and there are other mapping solutions. I just use City Mapper because I'm used to using it. Um, it kind of 
has some vague idea of where the bus might be, but it's not where it's going. And then when it tries to map it out, it doesn't map it going down Cane Hill Drive and out. It maps it kind of running round the outside, round a footpath. Uh, when I go to open street map using the transport layer, I can see where the two stops are and they appear at least on the right side of the street and I can see that they're linked by a stop area. In the standard layer, um, one of the bus stops gets further and further away and more into the woods. Um, this bit here is an area of woods. When I put the humanitarian layer, please, I have no idea what these what these layers are. Um, one bus stop kind of disappears um, and it should actually be on the road here, not up salt or close. TfL Journey Planner does something similar but different to City Mapper, which I quite approve of, is it has you walk to Salter Close, and then instead of following the walkway around the road, which is what it does, the bus seems to seems to think it takes this weird route around the outside. Um, this is the TFL Journey Planner when used on the website. Um, it tells me that I'm at Cane Hill Drive and I need to walk to Salter Close, but it maps Salter Close being right down the bottom here and only shows me part of the journey. So it in fact has me walking past two bus stops that I that I actually would be catching the 404 on. Uh, where else do we go? Um, open open street map when I have the OPVN cart layer on, it again links, it has the Row it has the um, bus going on the right road, but again it has one of the bus stops. It has the two bus stops and they're linked in the right area. Um, Ito World, no offense to Ito World, um, the bus stops are m quite a bit away from the road, and it looks like it feels like the bus stops are in the right place, but the roads moved slightly. Whatever's gone on there, and in the very last one on. Again, a TfL journey planner, we've got the bus stop showing in the right place, but not where the bus is going. And, or no, this is where I started. This is the woods. This is, this bus stop should be here. And this bus stop should be about here. So there's something not quite working with how that one is being mapped. And I think that's all the different maps that I could find of this. So I wanted to just kind of ask people, um, is this the sort of example that is useful, that shows the problem in a way that shows the problem? Um, and do you have any thoughts or any comments on how and why this happened? Well, not how this happens, but, but but sort of where this happens and how we could go about trying to make this make a bit more sense. Gerard, I feel like I picked on you and I'm so sorry I used a TFL stop. It was just uh, the one Kane, that we could yeah. find. Cane Hill Drive, yeah. Um, one service change that was actually brought in during uh, lockdown, just I think March of last year it came in. Um, how can I be concise with it? Um, the issue is both the cost and the method needed to update underlying mapping systems. Um, and also, you know, as I say, normally what we would do would be, we would actually go out and survey it and change it. Now, obviously, we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have another look at this in the aftermath to see if we can improve it because I'm also responsible for the journey planner as well as nap time, the two for the price of one. Um, what City Muppet do, I'm not particularly interested massively. Um, I have to get the sort of source data right, but I think the sort of summary effect is that you can get you can get a bulk download of, of mapping data, and that's your sort of base layer. The problem is how do you deal with incremental changes? You either increase the frequency of updating or you, you, you sort of manually change it yourself. Um, and to do that, you've got to actually have a sort of a clear sense of, of what, I mean, you could copy Google Maps, but that's a bit risky in some cases. 
you generally, in best practice, got to survey it yourself. Open street map is generally quite good um, when it's good, but you then the issue with open street map is that we've analysed it quite extensively, and where you have an active uh, user community, the standard and inf- the standard level of information on open street map can be superb. The problem being that you've got someone who has taken it upon themselves to actually map every single tree in South Harrow High Street. But you'll go to other parts of London where the you know the basic road network is is completely inaccurate because you're at the mercy of um, whether you've got active users within an area, but also where you do have active users, what their areas of, of interest and specialism are. So you might have a situation that cycle cycle routes tend to be very good on open street map in my experience, but other sort of things that that aren't quite if you like the interest areas of users. Um, would mean that they're not as, you know, it's not as good for maybe sort of building names or shops. But I think, you know, it, it, to sort of summarise it, it, it's, it's, if I was to summarise it in one phrase, Dr. J, it's how you actually deal with incremental changes. That's good to know. So, so the, the problem or not so much the cause of the problem, the, it's been obviously, there's an ordinance survey map here on the left, which shows what was there before there was a number of farms and everything, and it's been turned into uh, a new build estate. And those incremental changes just are not quite there in the way that we'd expect. Yeah, effectively, because as I say, there's a cost factor of it. I'm I'm sure I saw somewhere on on the mural that that someone had sort of referenced the, the, you know, the cost of, of, uh, ordinance survey updates um i think i saw that and i think it, it, it's you know that's sort of getting commercial sensitive information certainly um we update our base mapping six monthly or sort of you know once a year if that and it's quite a costly process but obviously where you've got incremental changes with new estates that, that's not particularly satisfactory you know you shouldn't really have to be you shouldn't be waiting for a year for it but then it's very fiddly to actually model it freehand it's um yeah yeah no i totally appreciate that and thank you for that that's that's been incredibly useful ian do you have any thoughts on this uh yeah quite a few some aren't principal to be fair are they really (laughs) because having worked in the industry as a number of us have to see the same data being presented in this manner to public facing it doesn't generate confidence in systems does it a few a few comments for that from my perspective would be is as a data creator in the first place you know yeah you're going to map it to where the nearest point is you don't deliberately go and map it in the north sea the accidents happen don't get me wrong but to see the same data interpreted in so many different ways and i can understand why i get so many uh, complaints from downstream users of other systems because you've no control over it and if they're not interpreting the data or placing it in the right place what can you do as a data creator is what I'd, I'd leave it to. Yeah. And yeah, the, we, you know, we briefly mentioned about different mapping systems earlier about oh, um, OpenStreetMap. Yeah, we've gone on uh, using that because our data tool won't import the latest version of um, a format of OS. So yeah, I'm a devil in deep blue sea really because uh, example, there was a new um, bridge uh, on the M6 uh, in Lancaster. So built it where i thought it was but when i've looked at it across a new map it's uh it must be about uh, 15 meters to the left so everything's floating across the river if you went and watched <laughs> it literally so yeah so it's uh, interesting and unfortunately i'm gonna have to dive off the call but the one query i've got after all this having been on the bod system as well is at the moment there are there's companies like ito who are doing um analysis and they do present reports if you log into and everything we're not going to be going down the road of that if your data that is submitted fails to meet a data standard, it's going to be kicked out of the system on the 2nd of August, aren't we? Because no, that no, will cause nothing. all sorts of issues. No, no, we would not do anything like that. What we're trying to do in building the new data system or the or, or the new service for NAPTAN is look at what we can prov- what we can start to put in that improves the data incrementally. What are things that we can do that means that you as a data pro- producer, you can see, oh, oops, that that bridge wasn't quite where I thought it was. 
everything's got to move 15 metres to the left, you can be flagged up quite quickly on things like that. But also, you can be assisted. I want to figure out ways to ensure that you get really good quality data, that the bus operators get the good location data that they need to do their routes, that passengers get the location data that they need in their phones to know exactly where the bus stop is and where that, the bus is going to be going. That gets down to all the downstream systems after the creator has made any changes actually update their software and that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's and that's one of the things, um, it's like the data interpretation um, that I'm trying to figure out ways that we could have those conversations of saying to people, instead of having to bulk download all of NAPTAN and it's hard to do and you've got to do all of this stuff, we can give you um, some guidance on it. We can give you some nice little tools for it, some nice APIs and things like that. So you can just get the changes in the last couple of weeks and those changes will include and you can also get a checklist of the changes so that you know what sort of things that you're going to be getting. So it's trying to think, um, I wouldn't say think outside the box because I hate I hate that whole idea, um, but it's trying to think of the best ways to communicate to those downstream users to get them excited about NAPTAN. Oh, which... well, that's the look, man. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, you've got some thoughts. Hey, yeah, it was just following on maybe from what Ian was saying around downstream systems and how the data is used. So a customer is looking at a map to look at where the stop is, but equally important for them is the punctuality of a bus. And if a ticket machine is trying to work out where it is in relation to a bus stop, um, that, that's very important for the customer. So it knows, especially maybe in a bus stop or a, a, in a... Um, a collection where there's lots of stops, making sure we're in the right place at the right time. Um, but also from a BOD's point of view and bus operators, they're now being measured on punctuality and performance. So it's vital for them to make sure that they have accurate data. Absolutely. And this is one of the things that I know BOD's trying to do some work on around street names, bearings and things like that. And they did they try to do some programmatic data cleansing. Um, and I believe a lot of the places they ran into problems are where they've used one mapping system um, and it's been a couple of meters off, which meant, which has meant some stops have been put on a different road or on the other side of the street. And this has um, caused some, some data moments. And what we're trying to do is have a look at can we do this better can we build something into naptan that flags to you hey this stop appears to be in the north sea or hey we think you've put the stop in slightly the wrong place because it suddenly moved 100 miles do you want to go and double check that number that you just put in and kind of trying to do something smart to help you all do better data cool thank you I think maybe no problems. if bus operators are being measured on their on their punctuality and it's not in the right place, I think they're going to shout pretty quickly that it needs updating as well because they could self police. You're going to get um, mm. operators and customers trying to uh, create feedback. And I think this is also part of the problem of there's this notion of a bus stop outside of NAPTAN, and that's something that we're just trying to get in front of to ensure that all bus stops are a NAPTAN because otherwise we're going to go back 20 plus years um, to before NAPTAN times when nobody knew where all the bus stops were. And that's a situation none of us want to be in. Dan. Yeah, just a quick uh, thought. I don't know what to bring up, but uh, using North the example of stop sitting so far out and validating that, I always thought that with AVL data now coming in as part of BOD, surely that's a good validation of working out where a stop is or a stop isn't. Because if you're getting live GPS of where a bus is going, it's got to go near a stop, and surely that's the way you should be validating it. Um, that would be that is a brilliant idea, and I know that there are some people looking at that. There is some interesting problems that are caused with this and that's some of what we're trying to ensure that the data um, looks right so that it does actually kind of start to match up and make and make sense a lot more. 
Um, so we've got about 20 minutes left, which means that I'm running well and truly on time. Um, does anyone else, is there any other thoughts on mapping and this un, un, unholy mess of maps that anyone else has? Is there any other, if anyone's got another example or wants to flag up an example from their, from their um, world, so it's not just me picking on TFL, um, please let me know and I'll use that as the next one. Um, so if you've got one stop that you know is in a particular spot, but it's being mapped in all kinds of different places, that is also going to be really good for us being able to sit down and trace through where some of these downstream systems are not using them correctly. Um, I also tried to get the mapping for BODs from this, but um, honestly, TFL, trying to get this level of accuracy of TFL's data out of BODs would have crashed my computer badly, and I just... I, I, I left that alone for now, but I, we can actually go and start trying to track down and see whether or not BODS actually has this mapped in the right place as well. So in the last little bit, um, we're just going to do a quick run through what's going on and what's coming up. So we are currently running a private beta um, for all of those who aren't on the private beta. We've got a private beta for the download. Um, so we can download um, a stop CSV file for national. You can download a stop CSV for a single ally. And we're building that out incrementally so that you end up with all the right things. One of the things that we've done with that is we've been able to re, we've rebuilt the system and it's taking a different philosophy to the old system. So the new system, whatever data is given to us, is the data that we present back to the user. There's no changing the data or manipulating the data in any sense. So this is what we're really interested in finding out from people. In doing that, do any of the downstream stuff break because you've been expecting data that's been cleansed a particular way, and now we're no longer cleansing it, and there's four values instead of where there used to only be two, or things like that, just trying to understand what the impacts are. And what we want to do is kind of sit down with you and understand how you would repair those impacts and how we would make them work. Um, then the next things that we're working on, that's what we're in the midst of planning at the moment. So to get the beta, to get the private beta underway, we had to do a lot of security testing to make sure that everything worked. And we also had to build a little bit of the identity and verification. I will be coming back to you at some point to talk a little bit more about that three hat model and then also understanding um, bus operators and downstream software companies and just trying to understand if it's useful for a bus operator to have its own account, does it need its own account? Is there things that you might want to pass back that would require an account? We just kind of want to play around and have a think about those things. But the first thing that we're going to be focusing on is giving local authorities and getting the right people in local authorities, the right levels so that we can also tell them when stuff happens, because that's one of the things that I, I uncovered in a couple of the previous meetings around when people should know about things. Um, well, we're, what we're kind of looking at doing is some stuff around feedback. Now, this isn't feedback from me to you or feedback from a user to somebody else. This is feedback from the system to the people who are putting in data so that we can go, hey, you've accidentally put a comma in where you should have put in a, a, a slash or a semicolon. This is flagged up and let's get that to you in less than five minutes rather than a couple of days later. So the current system is very slow at giving you any feedback when you fail validation and we're trying to figure out ways to make that faster and to make that more reliable. And one of the things that we thought would be quite simple would be to choose a business rule and put in some business rules and kind of use this feedback thing to tell you about business rules. As you can see from mapping and as you can see from naming, trying to find business rules that work is just a whole tin of spaghetti. And we're going to keep on pulling that out. Um, 
there's some other stuff that we're having to do and there's some pieces that we're having to do maybe a little bit faster than we anticipated doing. Um, one of them is fixing or I won't say turning off the old system, making the old system, moving people onto the new system faster. Um, and this is because there's some data in the old, in current NAPTAN, especially from a couple of nine of the of some nine stops, some nine XX series stops that isn't incorrectly. It's not showing up in some formats and it's showing up in others. And it's also showing up with a couple of missing fields that are important for some people's systems. So we're trying to figure out how we can get that, how we can understand that, but also how we can make sure that our data is right and move people on to picking up the data from, from, from new NAPTAN as quickly as possible. Old NAPTAN can't really be worked on at the moment. Um, there's some things that we need to do. We're going to be doing some more thinking about um, looking at what the future of NAPTAN might be like. One of the big ones is how do we bring in accessibility in a good way so that the new accessible bus regulations and all of those things, NAPTAN is able to support them in a way that's extensible, that's incremental. You don't have to go and totally redo all of your software to do the things that you need to do. Um, the goal, the, you, you will have all seen this before, it's, 25, it's 2025, we've got data producers, local transport authorities, able to put data in, it goes in and moves across all of these systems really nicely, and it comes out the other side to the data consumers who can pull it out in whatever formats they need and put it into consumer apps or put it into ecosystem apps, and ecosystem apps are things like Diva, Mints, the Omnibus, uh, Omnimap, Omni, Omni Collection, React Accessibility, et cetera. And the entire goal that everyone on this call and everyone in this whole thing is working towards is increased public transport usage. We want people to enjoy using buses. We want people to be able to happily hop on a bus and do those sorts of things. So if you have a look through this and if you have any thoughts and you're like, oh, that's really important, come and talk to me about it, or oh, no, I don't like that, I don't think you should be touching that with a barge pole, you're going to get yourself in a, in a mile of trouble. When has that ever stopped me? Um, but please indicate that for us and let us know what sort of things that we should be looking at. Um, so I'll leave this open and, and you can all take a few minutes to do that. But in the last 10 minutes, this should say mapping, not names, if we if we're looking at mapping and what we've done and what we've done today and thinking about the whole mapping process and also the sort of stuff that we did today around talking about it take a few minutes and give us some feedback what gave you joy what was really good and useful on this call what frustrated you what didn't work? What did we try and it just didn't work? It was not quite the right place to be looking or we didn't give enough time to delve into that. And what made you sad? What things were missed? What things should be happening that we don't seem to have picked up on yet? So um, if you could take a few minutes about that and just um, have a think about that. And the very last thing, if you wanna to talk to me or Adrian, who's now on screen, um, these are our contact details. Um, feel free to get in touch. Feel free to let us know what we're doing right. Please let us know what we're doing wrong. <laughs> Please let us know what's what's not working and what are the things that you really need us to do to support you and what are the things that DFT should be doing? What are the things, what are the wider things that, that we could be taking out? Are there things that we've completely missed? I mean, we're focusing on buses here, but there's other there are other public transport systems. And there are even funky new public transport systems like e-scooters and Santander bikes and Lime bikes and all of those things. Should those be in NAPTAN? Should we be thinking about where they are as well? Should I know that I can come out of a station and grab a higher bike because there's a bike rack just outside? Should that be part of me planning my journey? So have a think about these these things and just give us feedback. Um, and thank you, everybody. Nicholas. 
got an answer. <laughs> You've got an answer. Uh, got an oh. answer. Um, it's simply Google Maps and Apple Maps is are what my colleagues are using to get the coordinates, and they're just recording it using GPS. And when you say GPS, um, this is all the way back under constraints, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, let me zoom back to constraints. There was a moment there, I was like, you've got an answer. And I was like, I don't even remember that we had a question. Um, <laughs> so, so they're using Google Maps and Apple Maps. And when you say GPS, is this a handheld GPS or a phone GPS? It's the GPS locator in the phone. Where, you know, where the, where if you're in Google Maps, you've got the little blue circle, which perhaps indicates where you are. And then you can record the um, the coordinates from there. Great, that's fantastic. At, just whilst you, you mentioned about um, bikes, that's actually something that that uh, is actually possible at the moment, and it's actually something that we have on our uh, website for our uh, services in. Um, Pool and Bournemouth, because um, we were one of the original trial areas for barrel bikes, and we actually have a direct feed into our journey planning facility, where it actually tells you how many bikes are, are at a docking station. Although that's probably a bit over over describing it, because they're literally a painted rectangle on the pavement. <laughs> Oh, so I these are not on their ones. <clears throat> and I'll put docking station and I'll just put that in uh, inverted commas because I take it you don't lock your bikes down in quite the way that London uh, does. No, because it's all app enabled and, and that. So you, you download an app, um, have an account with Beryl, and when you're at the docking station, you use the app to unlock the phone. Um, and I think a similar thing is being done with scooter, e scooters as well, because again, it, it, this is a, a trial area again for um, f for e scooters, and again, it's 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 through through barrel. Brilliant! Thank you so much for that. Um, I will probably come and have a chat with you at some point about this. Yeah, and just try and uh, try and understand. But that's brilliant, Peter. You've got oh, just, some thoughts. I'm just wondering if, if enough has been um, thought about how maps are being used uh, and the copyright uh, requirements of these maps. It, it's been a, a real issue in, in the past with the, the OS license and understanding uh, the conditions around that. Of course, local authorities have um, um, have a uh, uh, may have a license to use the OS uh, data, and um, but it's, it's really important to understand what you're deriving from the map and whether you have the rights to do so. Uh, and particularly if Google Maps and uh, Apple Maps are being referred to as being the source of NAPTAN data, we could get into a very um, uh, difficult problem if NAPTAN data from government was deemed to uh, include um, copyright of uh, some very large corporations. So I just wonder whether that's been been um, considered. Uh, it, it, there are ways around it, which we've in the past when I was working travel line we explored with um, OS. Um, you can be very careful about it. You can use multiple sources. There's lots of ways. But the, the most important thing is 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 to leave it um, somewhat vague uh, and not to say where you got it from uh, because in the end you are establishing a position which may not be a position on any map and that of course is maybe your defense uh, you can refer <laughs> to lots of maps um, in the course of doing that and compare them um, but you the, maybe you keep um, to mu pretty much to yourself exactly how you decided um, the map. <laughs> now, if, even that advice is is, is off the record. <laughs> I totally I totally understand it. Um, as you might see, I've made a quick note for me and Adrian. We've already got somebody to talk to about another question that came up about stops. So um, I've just made a note to, just to double check on 
if we use a map or if people are using maps, what's the what's the DFT legal position um, with the with the open data? Um, I'm just going to take the last two minutes just to run through because I see there's quite a bit of sad. So let me understand what the sad is. First, I'm going to have a look at the happy. Uh, or the joy. Always good to see we're all working toward the same goal. And despite little regional differences, we're all doing the same thing. I'm kind of liking that too. Um, things that frustrated us, different interpretations of the same data by downstream users. All oh, that is so frustrating. Um, I wasn't actually aware of those different mapping sources. <laughs> um, we still haven't decided the best way to map. The examples you showed illustrates the problem. Yeah, and I think that's what I would like to do some research and come back with and when we come back with mapping too, not coming back with solutions, coming back with a couple of options and saying these are the things that we think we should be exploring. What do you think about them? And do you and here's the here's the kind of pros and cons and how do we move forward? Uh, things that made us sad, what are we missing? Should there be a central DFT mapping system that helps helps remove the issues provided by third party systems? That's a really good question. And that's something that I think we need to go and explore. Incorporating accessibility is a whole big of can of worms. Yeah, I totally agree. Not so much what to include and how to include it, but the need for surveying every stop and updating the software and then keeping this up to date. Absolutely. Um, I One of the things that made me really sad, I did a bit of research on how many times we've surveyed the accessibility of bus stops uh, and whether or not that data has been incorporated in a useful way. And there was one done in 2010 and another one in, in 2016. And now we would need to do it again if we wanted to incorporate the data, even if we took both of those as a starter for 10, because stuff has changed so much. So, um, and we want to make sure that if we do it, if it's ever done again, it's done in a way that is stickable and updatable and usable by as many people as possible. In an ideal world, a map should only be used to show the results, not generate the data. Absolutely. Should there be an ability to see previous data, especially particularly old stop names? That's a really good question. I really like that. I really think that's something to, to have think about. So this is like the stop that is now called something that used to be called something else that was called the sun and the sands that was then called the butcher's arms that was then called something else because those were the names of the pubs. I, I, I kind of like that ability, almost like stepping back in time on Street View. Should the bearings have greater variances than just north, etc.? How many of us have stops of between the two compass points available and they just look odd when, pot, when plotted? Um, no and agree. OK, so this is something that I think Sounds contentious enough. Um, I've got a little section set up called school stops and I'm kind of interested in bringing this along and I might bring it along to that meeting and ask people what your thoughts are, because I know that there are some that lock to one bearing and lock to the other. They're kind of in that midpoint and whichever one you choose, some automated system will always choose the other. Um, something in alternate modes. Alternate modes, e.g. scooters, bikes, etc., are supported in NetX and Siri 2.1. Alternate modes are supported in NetX. Yeah, thank you very much. And that's one of the things that we want to consider. Should we be moving to NetX? Should NetX, is NetX UK where we should be heading? Is that going to future proof us in the right way? Is that going to give us data that is interoperable, that can be used by all these different systems, that can be connected with all these other systems that are running around DFT, that's all open data, and that's all created by local authorities. Can we use that in ways that are, I hate to use the word, but sexy, fun, interesting, you know, could, could create wonderful new solutions to help people use public transport. There is a CEN project to develop an accessibility profile for NetX, which will become a directive in the EU, but we could learn from. I'd love to learn from them and I'd love to work with them on that. So that's a really, really good point. Um, and is there anything else? Let me scroll sideways. But that's great. Thank you very much, everybody, for your feedback, your time, your input. It is, again, amazing to have everyone kind of coming through and, and really taking part in this. I really appreciate your time. I hope you've had a fun couple of hours. 
I've lost my voice and I'm about to go away and collapse in a corner. Nicholas, you've got a question or you've got your I, hand up. I, I've uh, I've just put a quick screen grab next to the comment you made about the bikes and that, uh, just so you can uh, you can see uh, for yourself what 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 basically it looks like with the with the bikes on. You're fantastic. Thank you so much for that. That's going to help me go and look at that and look at how we could because I take it this data doesn't sit in NAP10. So uh, no, no. I think I think yeah. It, it's 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 passenger who who power power our website, um, and it's something that they've done in collaboration with Beryl, um, and it's actually got the locations of bikes. Even if they're not in the docking station, it turns out I wasn't aware of that. Um, but if you selected a a docking station it tells you how many bikes, how many scooters are available, and they also have the room to drop them off. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Um, I'll definitely get in touch with passenger and and have a chat with them and see if we can use some of some of their learnings to make this better. Because yeah. I know that they did a lot of work to try to improve um, the the data on Naptan, and I know the four percent of Naptan data is bad came from some of their work but i'm yeah. also one of the things that i'm aiming for is to show napton data is actually not as bad as people think it's pretty good data and we want to kind of change the narrative and go napton sexy data it's great data it's good data yeah, and you can do I, a lot of things with it i think it does help with the with their, their they've got a very proactive attitude because they're constantly wanting to develop their sites to to capture as much as possible so clearly mm. That would be a good sort of two-way development possible Absolutely. There as well, I think. Yeah. 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 And I think that's there's some of the next people that we want to start talking to and bringing into the private beta. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Nicholas. Really Thanks. appreciate your feedback no and your and your input. It's fantastic.